Hello, I am Tanish, and I will be reading W.E.B. Du Bois' Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil, originally published in 1920 by Harcourt, Brace, and Company, New York. This is from Project Gutenberg. Two. The souls of white folk. High in the tower where I sit above the loud complaining of the human sea, I know many souls that toss and whirl and pass, but none there are that intrigue me more than the souls of white folk. Of them, I am singularly clairvoyant. I see in and through them. I view them from unusual points of vantage. Not as a foreigner do I come, for I am native, not foreign, bone of their thought and flesh of their language. Mine is not the knowledge of the traveler or the colonial composite of dear memories, words, and wonder. Nor yet is my knowledge that which servants have of masters or mass of class or capitalist of artisan. Rather, I see these souls undressed and from the back and side. I see the working of their entrails. I know their thoughts and they know that I know. This knowledge makes them now embarrassed, now furious. They deny my right to live and be and call me Miss Birth. My word is to them more, mere bitterness and my soul pessimism. And yet as they preach and strut and shout and threaten, crouching as they clutch at rags at, of facts and fancies to hide their nakedness, they go twisting, flying by my tired eyes and I see them ever stripped ugly human. The discovery of personal whiteness among the world's peoples is a very modern thing. A 19th and 20th century matter indeed. The ancient world would have laughed at such a distinction. The middle age regarded skin color with mild curiosity. And even up into the 18th century, we were hammering our national mannequins into one great universal man with fine frenzy, which ignored color and race even more than birth. Today, we have changed all that. And the world in a sudden emotional conversion has discovered that it is white and by that token, wonderful. This assumption <clears throat> that of all hues of God, whiteness alone is inherently and obviously better than brownness or tan leads to curious acts. Even the sweeter souls of the dominant world as they discourse with me on weather, weal and woe are continually playing above their actual words and obligado of tune and tone saying, my poor unwhite thing, weep not nor rage. I know too well that the curse of God lies heavy on me. Why? That is not for me to say, but be brave. Do your work in your lowly sphere, praying the good Lord that into heaven above where all is love, you may one day be born white. I do not laugh. I am quite straight faced as I ask soberly. But what on earth is whiteness that one should so desire it? Then always, somehow, some way, silently but clearly, I am given to understand that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen. Now, what is the effect on a man or a nation when it comes passionately to believe 
such an extraordinary dictum as this, that nations are coming to believe it is manifest daily, wave on wave, each with increasing virulence is dashing this new religion of whiteness on the shores of our time. Its first effects are funny. The strut of the southerner, the arrogance of the English Menemuk, the whoop of the hoodlum who vicariously, vicariously leads your mob. Next, it appears dampening generous enthusiasm in what we once counted glorious. To free the slave is discovered to be tolerable only in so far as it freed his master. Do we sense somnolent writhings in black Africa or angry groans in India or triumph bonsais, triumphant bonsais in Japan? To your tents, O Israel, these nations are not white. After the more comic manifestations and the chilling of generous enthusiasm come subtler, darker deeds. Everything considered, the title to the universe claimed by white folk is faulty. It ought at least to look plausible. How easy then by emphasis and omission to make children believe that every great soul the world ever saw was a white man's soul, that every great thought the world ever knew was a white man's thought, that every great deed the world ever did was a white man's deed, that every great dream the world ever sang was a white man's dream. In fine, that if the world were dropped, everything, that could not fairly be attributed to white folk. The world would, if anything, be even greater, truer, better than now. And if all this be a lie, is it not a lie in a great cause? Here it is that the comedy verges to tragedy. The first minor note is struck all unconsciously by those worthy souls in whom consciousness of high dis descent brings burning desire to spread the gift abroad. The obligation of nobility to the ignoble. Such sense of duty assumes two things, a real possession of the heritage and its frank appreciation by the humble born. So long then as humble black folk voluble with thanks receive barrels of old clothes from lordly and generous whites, there is much mental peace and moral satisfaction. But when the black man begins to dispute the white man's title to certain alleged bequests of the fathers in wage and position, authority and training, and when his attitude toward charity is sullen anger, rather than humble jollity, when he insists on his human right to swagger and swear and waste, then the spell is suddenly broken and the philanthropist is ready to believe that Negroes are impudent, that the South is right and that Japan wants to fight America. After this, the descent to hell is easy. On the pale, white faces, which the great billows whirl upward to my tower, I see again and again, often and still more often, a writing of human hatred, a deep and passionate hatred, vast by the very vagueness of its expressions. Down through the green waters on the bottom of the world where men move to and fro, I have seen a man an educated gentleman grow livid with anger because a little silent black woman was sitting by herself in a Pullman car. He was a white man. I have seen a great grown man curse a little child who had wandered into the wrong waiting room searching for its mother. 
Hear you damn black, blank, blank, blank. He was white. In Central Park, I have seen the upper lip of a quiet, peaceful man curled back in a tigerish snarl of rage because black folk rode by in a motor car. He was a white man. We have seen, you and I, city after city, drunk and furious with ungovernable lust of blood, mad with murder, destroying, killing, and cursing, torturing human victims because somebody accused of crime happened to be of the same color as the mob's innocent victim, victims, and because that color was not white. We have seen merciful God in these wild days and in the name of civilization, justice, and motherhood. What have we not seen right here in America of orgy, cruelty, barbarism, and murder done to men and women of Negro descent. Up through the foam of green and weltering waters wells this great mass of hatred. In wilder, fiercer violence. Until I look down and know that today with the millions of my people, no misfortune could happen. Of death, pestilence, death and pestilence, failure and defeat that would not make the hearts of millions of their fellows beat with fierce vindictive joy. Do you doubt it? Ask your own soul what it would say if the next census were to report that half of black America was dead and the other half dying. Unfortunate, unfortunate. But where is the mis misfortune? Mine? Am I in my blackness the sole sufferer? I suffer. And yet, somehow, above the suffering, above the shackled anger that beats the bars, above the hurt that crazes their surges, in me a vast pity. Pity for a people imprisoned and enthralled, hampered and made miserable for such a cause, for such a fantasy. Conceive this nation of all human peoples engaged in a crusade to make the world safe for democracy. Can you imagine the United States protesting against Turkish atrocities in Armenia while the Turks are silent about mobs in Chicago and St. Louis? What is Louvain compared with Memphis, Waco, Washington, Dyersburg, and Astro Springs. In short, what is the black man but America's Belgium? And how could America condemn in Germany that which she commits just as brutally within her own borders? A true and worthy ideal frees and uplifts a people. A false ideal imprisons and lowers. Say to men, earnestly and repeatedly. Honesty is best, knowledge is power. Do unto others as you would be done by. Say this and act it, and the nation must move toward it, if not to it. But say to a people, the one virtue is to be white, and the people rush to the inevitable conclusion, kill the blank. Is not this the record of present America? Is not this its headlong progress? Are we not coming more and more day by day to making the statement, I am white, the one fundamental tenet of their practical morality? Only when this basic iron rule is involved is our defense of right nationwide and prompt. Murder may swagger, theft may rule, and prostitution may flourish and the nation gives but spasmodic intermittent and lukewarm attention. But let the murder be murderer be black or the thief brown or the violator of womanhood have a drop of Negro blood 
and the righteousness of the indignation sweeps the world. Nor would this fact make the indignation less justifiable did not we all know that it was blackness that was condemned and not crime. In the awful <clears throat> cataclysm of world war, where from beating, slandering, and murdering us, the white world turns temporarily aside to kill each other, we are, we of the darker peoples, looked on in mild amaze. Among some of us, I doubt not, this sudden descent of Europe into hell brought unbounded surprise. To others over wide area, it brought the schadenfreude of the bitterly hurt. But most of us, I judge, looked on silently and sorrowfully in sober thought, seeing sadly the prophecy of our own souls. Here is a civilization that has boasted much. Neither Roman nor Arab, Greek nor Egyptian, Persian nor Mongol ever took himself and his own perfectness, perfectness with such disconcerting seriousness as the modern white man. We whose shame, humiliation, and deep insult is aggrandizement so often involved were never deceived. We look at him clearly with world old eyes and saw simply a human thing, weak and pitiable and cruel, even as we are and were. These Spider-Men and world mastering demigods listened, however, to no low tongues of ours, even when we pointed silently to their feet of clay. Perhaps we as folk of simpler soul and mere more primitive type have been most stuck in the welter of recent years by the utter failure of white religion. We have curled our lips in something like contempt as we have witnessed glib apology and weary explanation. Nothing of the sort deceived us. A nation's religion is its life, and as such, white Christianity is a miserable failure. Nor would we be unfair in this criticism. We know that we too have failed as you have and have rejected many a Buddha, even as you have denied Christ. But we acknowledge our human frailty. While you, claiming superhumanity, scoff endlessly at our, at our shortcomings. The number of white individuals who are practicing, with even reasonable approximation, the democracy and unselfishness of Jesus Christ is so small and unimportant as to be fit subject for jests in Sunday supplements and in punch, life, le rire, le rire, and flagging bladder. In her foreign mission work, the extraordinary self-deception of white religion is epitomized. Solemnly, the world, the white world, sends $5 million worth of missionary propaganda to Africa each year, and in the same 12 months, adds $25 million worth of the vilest gin manufactured. Peace to the augurs of world. We may, however, grant without argument the religious ideals have always far outrun their human devotees. Let us then turn to more mundane matters of honor and fairness. The world today is trade. The world has turned shopkeeper. History is economic history. Living is earning a living. Is it necessary to ask how much of high emprise and honorable conduct has been found here? Something to be sure. The establishment of world credit systems 
is built on splendid and realizable faith in fellow man. But it is after all so low and elementary a step that sometimes it looks merely like honor among thieves for the revelation of highway robbery and low cheating in the business world and in all its great modern centers have raised in the hearts of all true men in our day an exceeding great cry for revolution in our basic methods and conceptions of industry and commerce. We do not for a moment forget the robbery of other times and races when trade was a most uncertain gamble. But was there not a certain honesty and frankness in the evil that argued a saner morality? There are more merchants today, surer deliveries, and wider well-being. But are there not also bigger thieves, deeper injustice, and more callous selfishness in well-being? But that is it, May. Be that as it may. <sighs> Certainly, the nicer sense of honor that has risen ever and again in groups of forward-thinking men has been curiously and broadly blended. Consider our cheapest industry, fighting. Laboriously, the Middle Ages built its rules of fairness, equal armament, equal notice, equal conditions. What do we see today? Machine guns against acid guys. Conquest sugared with a religion, mutilation and rape masquerading as culture. All of this with vast applause at the superiority of white over black soldiers. War is horrible. This the dark world knows to its awful cost. But has it just become horrible in these last days when under essentially equal conditions, equal armament and equal waste of wealth, white men are fighting white men with surgeons and nurses hovering near? Think of the wars through which we have lived in the last decade in German Africa, in British Nigeria, in French and Spanish Morocco, in China, in Persia, in the Balkans, in Tripoli, in Mexico, and in a dozen lesser places, were not these horrible too? Mind you, there were, there were for most of these wars no Red Cross funds. The whole little Belgium and her pitiable plight. But has the world forgotten Congo? What Belgium now suffers is not half, not even a tenth of what she has done to black Congo since Stanley's great dream of 1880. Down the dark forests of inmost Africa sailed this modern Sir Galahad in the name of the noble-minded men of severe several nations to introduce commerce and civilization. What came of it? Rubber and murder, slavery in its worst form, wrote Glaive in 1895. Harris declares that King Leopold's regime meant the death of 12 million natives. But what we who were behind the scenes felt most keenly was the fact that the real catastrophe in the Congo was desolation and murder in the large sense. The invasion of family life, the ruthless destruction of every social barrier, the, sh the shattering of every tribal law, the introduction of criminal practices which struck the chiefs of the people dumb with horror. In a world, in a word, a veritable avalanche of filth and immorality overwhelmed the Congo tribes. Yet the fields of Belgium laughed 
The cities were gay. Art and science flourished. The, group, the groans that helped to nourish this civilization fell on deaf ears because the world round about was doing the same sort of thing elsewhere on its own account. As we saw the dim, the dead dimly through rifts of battle smoke and heard faintly the cursings and accusations of blood brothers, we darker men said, this is not Europe gone mad. This is not aberration nor insanity. This is Europe. This seeming terrible is the real soul of white culture, back of all culture, stripped and visible today. This is where the world has arrived, these dark and awful depths and not the shining and ineffable heights of which it boasted. Here is whither the might and energy of modern humanity has really gone. But may not the world cry back at us and ask, what better thing have you to show? What have you done or would do better than this if you had today the world rule? Paint with all riot of hateful colors and thin skin of Europe, European culture. Is it not better than any culture that arose in Africa or Asia? It is. Of this, there is no doubt and never has been. But why is it better? Is it better because Europeans are better, nobler, greater, and more gifted than other folk? It is not. Europe has never produced and never will in our day bring forth a single human soul who cannot be matched and overmatched in every line of human endeavor by Asian and Africa, Asia and Africa. Run the gamut, if you will, and let us have the Europeans who in sober truth overmatch Nefertiti, Nefertari, Muhammad, Ramesses, and Askia, Confucius, Buddha, and Jesus Christ. If we would scan the calendar of thousands of lesser men in like comparison, the result would be the same. But we cannot do this because of the deliberately educated ignorance of white schools by which they remember Napoleon and forget Sonny Ali, Sonny Ali. The greatness of Europe has lain in the width of the stage on which she has played her part, the strength of the foundations on which she has builded and a natural human ability no whit greater if as great than that of other days and races. In other words, the deeper reasons for the triumph of European civilization lie quite outside the quite outside and beyond Europe, back in the universal struggles of all mankind. Why then is Europe great? Because of the foundations which the mighty past have furnished her to build upon. The iron trade of ancient black Africa, the religion and empire building of yellow Asia, the art and science of the Dago Mediterranean shore, east, south, and west, as well as north. And where she has builded securely upon this great past and learned from it, she has gone forward to greater and more splendid human triumph. But where she has ignored this past, and forgotten and sneered at it. She has shown the cloven hoof of poor crucified humanity. She has played like other empires gone, the world fool. If then European triumphs and culture have been greater, so too may her failures have been greater. How great a failure and a failure in what does the world war betoken? Was it national jealousy of the sort of the 17th century 
that Europe has done more to break down national barriers than any preceding culture? Was it fear of the balance of power in Europe? Hardly, save in the half Asiatic problems of the Balkans. What then does Hauptmann mean when he says our jealous enemies forged an iron ring about our breasts and we knew our breasts had, no, had to expand, that we had to split asunder this ring or else we had to cease breathing. But Germany will not cease to breathe and so it came to pass that the iron ring was forced apart. Whither is this expansion? What is that breath of life thought to be so indispensable to a great European nation? Manifestly, it is expansion overseas. It is colonial aggrandizement, which explains and alone adequately explains the world war. How many of us today fully realize the current theory of colonial expansion of the relation of Europe, which is white, to the world, which is black and brown and yellow? Bluntly put, that theory is this. It is the duty of white Europe to divide up the darker world and administer it for Europe's good. This Europe has largely done. The European world is using black and brown men for all the uses which men know. Slowly but surely white culture is evolving the theory that darkies are born beasts of burden for white folk. It were silly <clears throat> to think otherwise, cries the cultured world with stronger and shriller accord. The supporting arguments grow and twist themselves in the mouths of merchants, scientists, soldier, traveler, writer, and missionary. Darker peoples are dark in mind as well as in body, of dark, uncertain, and imperfect descent, of frailer, cheaper stuff. They are cowards in the face of mousers and maxims. They have no feelings, aspirations, and love. They are fools, illogical idiots, half devil and half child. Such as they are, civilization must naturally raise them, but soberly and in limited ways. They are not simply dark white men. They are not men in the sense that Europeans are men. To the very limited extent of their shallow capacities, lift them to be useful to whites, to raise cotton, gather rubber, fetch ivory, dig diamonds, and then and let them be paid what men think they are worth. White men who know them to be well nigh worthless. Such degrading of men by men is as old as mankind and the invention of no one race or people ever have men striven to conceive of their victims as different from the victors. Endlessly different in soul and blood, strength and cunning, race and lineage. It has been left, however, to Europe and to modern days to discover the eternal worldwide mark of meanness. Color. Such is the silent revolution that has gripped modern European culture in the later 19th and 20th centuries. Its zenith came in boxer times. White supremacy was all but worldwide. Africa was dead, India conquered, Japan isolated, and China prostrate. While white America wedded her sword for mongrel Mexico and mulatto South America, lynching her own Negroes the while. Temporary halt in this program was made by little Japan and the white world immediately sensed the peril of such yellow presumption. Yellow. 
What sort of word would this be if yellow men must be treated white? Immediately, the eventually, the eventual overthrow of Japan became a subject of deep thought and intrigue. From St. Petersburg to San Francisco, from the key of heaven to the little brother of the poor. The using of men for the benefit of masters is no new invention of modern Europe. It is quite as old as the world. But Europe proposed to apply it on a scale and with an elaborateness of detail of which no former world ever dreamed. The imperial width of the thing, the heaven-defying audacity, makes its modern newness. The scheme of Europe was no sudden invention, but a way out of long pressing difficulties. It is plain to modern white civilization that the subjection of the white working classes cannot much longer be maintained. Education, political power, and increased knowledge of the technique and meaning of the industrial process are destined to make it make a more and more equitable distribution of wealth in the near future. The day of the very rich is drawing to a close, so far as individual white nations are concerned. But there is a loophole. There is a chance for exploitation on an immense scale for inordinate profit, not simply to be fair to the very rich, but to the middle class and to the laborers. This chance lies in the exploitation of darker peoples. It is here that the golden hand beckons. Here are no labor units or votes or questioning onlookers or inconvenient consciences. These men may be used down to the very bone and shot and maimed in punitive, punitive expeditions when they revolt. In these dark lands, industrial development may repeat in exaggerated form every horror of the industrial history of Europe from slavery and rape to disease and maiming with only one test of success, dividends. This theory of human culture and its aims has worked itself through warp and woof of our daily thought with a thoroughness that few realize. Everything great, good, efficient, fair, and honorable is white. Everything mean, bad, blundering, cheating, and dishonorable is yellow, a bad taste is brown, and the devil is black. The changes of, these, of this theme are continually rung in picture and story, in newspaper heading and moving picture, in sermon and school book, until, of course, the king can do no wrong. A white man is always right, and a black man has no right which a white man is bound to respect. There must come the necessary despisings and hatreds of these savage half-men, this unclean canal of the world, these dogs of men. All through the world, this gospel is preaching. It has its literature. It has its secret propaganda. And above all, it pays. There's the rub, it pays. Rubber, ivory, and palm oil. Tea, coffee, and cocoa. Bananas, oranges, and other fruit. Cotton, gold, and copper. They and a hundred other things which dark and sweating bodies hand up to the white world from pits of slime, pay and pay well. But of all that, the world gets, the black world gets only the pittance that the white world throws it disdainfully. <clears throat> so 
Small wonder then that in the practical world of things that be, there is jealousy and strife for the possession of the labor of dark millions, for the right to bleed and exploit the colonies of the world where this golden stream may be had, not always for the asking, but surely for the whipping and shooting. It was this competition for the labor of yellow, brown and black folks that was the cause of the world war. Other causes have been glibly given and other contributing causes there doubtless were, but they were subsidiary and subordinate to this vast quest of the dark world's wealth and toil. Colonies, we call them, these places where N-word are cheap and the earth is rich. They are those outlands where like a swarm of hungry locusts, white masters may settle to be served as kings wield the lash of slave drivers, rape girls and wives, grow as rich as Croesus, and send homeward a golden stream. They belt the earth, these places, but they cluster in the tropics with its darkened people, in Hong Kong and Anam, in Borneo and Rhodesia, in Sierra Leone and Nigeria, in Panama and Havana. These are the El Dorados toward which the world powers stretch itching palms. Which the world powers stretch itching palms. Germany at last one and united and secure on land, looking across the seas and seeing England with sources of wealth, ensuring a luxury and power which Germany could not hope to rival by the slower processes of exploiting her own peasants and working men, especially with these workers half in revolt, immediately built her navy and entered into a desperate competition for possession of colonies of darker peoples. To South America, to China, to Africa, to Asia Minor, she turned like a hound quivering on the leash impatient, suspicious, irritable, with bloodshot eyes and dripping fangs, ready for the awful word. England and France, crou France crouched watchfully over their bones, growling and wary, but gnawing industriously, while the blood of the dark world whetted their greedy appetites. In the background, shut out from the highway to the seven seas sat Russia and Austria, snarling and snapping at each other and at the last Mediterranean gate to the El Dorado, where the sick man enjoyed bad health and where millions of serfs in the Balkans, Russia and Asia offered a feast to greed well nigh as great as Africa. The fateful day came, it had to come. The cause of war, is preparation for war. And of all that Europe has done in a century, there is nothing that has equaled in energy, thought, and time her preparation for wholesale murder. The only adequate cause of this preparation was conquest and conquest, not in Europe, but primarily among the darker peoples of Asia and Africa. Conquest not for assimilation and uplift, but for commerce and degradation. For this and this mainly did Europe gird its, uh, herself at frightful cost for war. The red day dawned when the tinder was lighted in the Balkans and Austro-Hungary seized a bit which brought her a step nearer to the world's highway. She seized one bit and poised herself for another. Then came that curious chorus of challenges those leaping suspicions, raking all causes for distrust and rivalry and hatred, but saying little of the real and greatest cause. Each nation felt its deep interests involved, but how? Not surely in the death of Ferdinand, the warlike, not surely in the old half forgotten revenge for Alsace Lorraine, 
not even in the neutrality of Belgium. No, but in the possession of land overseas, in the right to colonies, the chance to levy endless tribute on the darker world, on coolies in China, on starving peasants in India, on black savages in Africa, on dying South Sea Islanders, on Indians of the Amazon, all this and nothing more. Even the broken reed on which we had rested high hopes of eternal peace, the guild of the laborers, the front of that very important movement of, for human justice on which we had builded most. Even this flew like a straw before the breath of King and Kaiser. Indeed, the flying had been foreshadowed when in Germany and America international, international socialists had all but red, yellow, and black men out of the kingdom of industrial justice. Subtly, had there been bribed, but effectively, were they not lordly whites? And should they not share in the spoils of rape? High wages in the United States and England might be the skillfully manipulated result of slavery in Africa and of peonage in Asia. With the dog in the manger's theory of trade, with the determination to reap inordinate profits and to exploit the weakest to the utmost, there came a new imperialism. The range for one's own nation to own the earth or at least a large enough portion of it to ensure as big profits as the na next nation. Where sections could not be owned by one dominant nation, there came a policy of open door, but the door was open to white people only. As to the darkest and weakest of peoples, there was but one unanimity in Europe, that which Hen Demberg of the German colonial office called the agreement with England to make, maintain white prestige in Africa, the doctrine of the divine right of white people to steal. Thus the world market most wildly and desperately sought today is the market where labor is cheapest and most helpless and profit is most abundant. This labor is kept cheap and helpless because the white world despises darkies. If one has the temerity to suggest that these working men may walk the way of white working, working men and climb by votes and self-assertion and education to the rank of men, he is howled out of court. They cannot do it, and if they could, they shall not for they are the enemies of the white race and the whites shall rule forever and forever and everywhere. Thus the hatred and despising of human beings from whom Europe wishes to extort her luxuries has led to such jealousy and bickering between the European nations that they have fallen afoul of each other and have fought like crazed beasts. Such is the fruit of human hatred. But what of the darker world that watches? Most men belong to this world with Negro and Negroid, East Indian, Chinese and Japanese. They form two thirds of the population of the world. A brief in humanity is a belief in colored men. A belief in humanity is a belief in colored men. If the uplift of mankind must be done by men, then the destinies of this world will rest ultimately in the hands of darker nations. What then is this dark world thinking? It is thinking that as wild and awful as this shameful war was, it is nothing to compare with that fight for freedom which black and brown and yellow men must and will make unless their oppression and humiliation and insult at the hands of the white world cease. The dark world is going to submit to its present treatment just as long as it must and not one moment longer. Let me say this again and emphasize it and leave no room for mistaken meaning. 
The world war was primarily the jealous and avaricious struggle for the largest share in exploiting darker races. As such, it is and must be, but the prelude to the armed and indignant protests of these despised and raped people, peoples. Today, Japan is hammering on the door of justice. China is raising her half manacled hands to knock next. India is writhing for the freedom to knock. Egypt is sullenly muttering. The Negroes of South and West Africa, of the West Indies and of the United States are just awakening to their shameful slavery. Is then this war the end of wars? Can it be the end so long as it's enthroned even in the souls of those who cry peace, the despising and robbing of darker peoples? If Europe hugs this solution, then this is not the end of war, world war. It is but the beginning. We see Europe's greatest sin precisely where we found Africa's and Asia's, in human hatred, the despising of men. With this difference, however, Europe has the awful lesson of the past before her, has the splendid results of widened areas of tolerance, sympathy, and love among men, and she faces a greater and indef infinitely greater world of men than any preceding civilization ever faced. It is curious to see America, the United States, looking on herself first as a sort of natural peacemaker, then as a moral protagonist in this terrible time. No nation is less fitted for this role. For two or more centuries, America has marched proudly in the ban of human hatred, making bonfires of human flesh and laughing at them hideously and making the insulting of millions more than a matter of dislike. Rather, a great religion of world war cry, up white, down black, to your tents, Oh, white folk, and world war with black and particolored party mongrel beasts. Instead of standing as a great example of the success of democracy and the possibility of human brotherhood, America has taken her place as an awful example of its pitfalls and failures so far as black and brown and yellow peoples are concerned. And this too, in spite of the fact that there has been no actual failure. The Indian is not dying out. The Japanese and Chinese have not menaced the land and the experiment of Negro suffrage has resulted in the uplift of 12 million people at a rate probably unparalleled in history. But what of this? America, land of democracy, wanted to believe in the failure of democracy so far as dark peoples were concerned, darker peoples were concerned. Absolutely without excuse, she established, she established a caste system, rushed into preparation for war and conquered tropical colonies. She stands today shoulder to shoulder with Europe in Europe's worst sin against civilization. She aspires to sit among the great nations who arbitrate the fate of lesser breeds without the law, and she is at times heartily ashamed even of the large number of new white people whom her democracy has admitted to place in power. Against this surging forward of Irish and German, of Russian Jew, Slav and Dago, Dago her social bars have not availed. But against Negroes, she can and does take her unflinching and immovable stand, backed by this new public policy of Europe. She trains her immigrants to this despising of blank from the day of their landing, and they carry and send the news back to the submerged classes in the fatherlands. All this I see and hear up in my tower above the thunder of the seven seas. From my narrowed windows, I stare into the night that looms beneath the cloud-swept stars. 
Eastward and westward storms are breaking. Great ugly whirlwinds of hatred and blood and cruelty. I will not believe them inevitable. I will not believe that all that was must, all that was must be, that all the shameful drama of the past must be done again today before the sunlight sweeps the silver seas. If I cry amid this roar of elemental forces, must my cry be in vain because it is but a cry, a small and human cry amid Promethean gloom? Back beyond the world and swept by these wild white faces of the awful dead, why will this soul of white folk, this modern Prometheus, hang bound by his own binding, tethered by a fable of the past? I hear this mighty cry reverberating through the world. I am white. Well and good, O Prometheus, divine thief. Is not the world wide enough for two colors? for many little shinings of the sun. Why then devour your own vitals if I answer even as proudly? I am black, 